This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And welcome to virtual worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. Whether you are a member of the church or a visitor who is visiting our webpage for this uh, time of worship, all are welcome. We begin our worship with the sounding of the chimes. Grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to this time of worship. Jesus said, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Let us prepare our hearts to receive once again the good news of Jesus Christ as together we listen to the morning prelude. To God be the glory. As we see the interior of our sanctuary, which is still decorated in the colors of Easter, we also notice the fresh flowers on the Lord's table as a reminder that many of you have dedicated flowers for this time of the year. But since we cannot be together, we still are announcing those dedications. So today's flowers are given to the glory of God by Dave and Carrie Panetta, in honor of their granddaughter Emily's college graduation from Molenberg College. Congratulations, Emily. Also, by the Hudson family, in fond memory of Craig's father, Joseph Hudson Jr. I have sad news to share with you, and that is that a member of our church, Mary Ludick, died this past Thursday, May 14th, at home, where she was receiving hospice services and was being cared for by her son, David, and her daughter, Linda. A memorial service will be held at a later date, but please pray now for Mary's friends and family as we give thanks to God for her life and for her faith. 
We've also been asked to pray today for Joan's friend, Diane, who will undergo brain surgery tomorrow at Temple University Hospital. And also prayers for Jonna's friend, Bob, who also is in the hospital. And please continue to pray for Darlene and her health issues, for Nancy's mother, Marjorie, at Masonic Village, and for Betty at Neshamini Manor, and all nursing home residents and caregivers who are at risk for the virus. Continue praying, please, for Carla's friends, Saudi and Maria. And for those members, again, who still are grieving the death of loved ones, who have died since the uh, stay in place orders were in effect and cannot gather to comfort each other and to have um, time together to worship in, uh, in community. So please continue to pray for Dee and Jim, for Sue, for Charlene, for Carol H, Carol W, and for Elwood and his family. Today's liturgists are Laura, Sue, Nicholas and Vincent. And if any of you would like to be an online liturgist, please contact the church. Today's musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Volkus on piano and organ, and by Paul Jensen on trumpet. And today's soloist is Jenny Ekstrom. Let us continue our worship with our opening hymn. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing, we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is Acts 17, verses 22 to 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of you own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold, or silver, or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man, man who he has appointed. And on this, and of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
we will be reading Psalms 66, verse 8 through 20. Bless our God, O peace, people, let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our back. The people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. You have brought us out to a spacious place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows through that may my lips uttered and my mouth I will offer to you burnt offering. the burnt offerings of saplings with the smoke of the sacrifice. sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I cherish inequity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has given heed to my words and my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has rejected my prayer, he has not rejected my prayer, or removed his steadfast love for me. Our epistle is from 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 13 through 22. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. In baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, 
not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me, because I live, you shall live also. In that day, you shall know that I am my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will disclose myself to him. Years ago, two decades ago almost, one summer when I was in seminary, I served as a hospital chaplain at Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center in New Brunswick, New Jersey. It was a requirement for becoming ordained, so there were about 12 other seminarians in the program with me, and we worked very closely together as a team to cover the entire medical center. And part of our teamwork was to provide 24-hour coverage for chaplaincy services, which meant that we had to take turns spending the night at the hospital after everyone else left at five o'clock. And one of those on-call duties was to stop by the emergency room periodically throughout the night to see if anyone needed a chaplain to pray with them. And if no one did need a chaplain, I would sit for a while in the ER waiting area chatting with the receptionist. Now, my memory has faded about those nights, but there's one night in particular that I'll never forget. There was nothing extraordinary about that night. It was something that happens every day in emergency rooms. It was well past midnight, and a young family of four came in, a mother carrying her toddler son, and with them were the father and an older sister. Now, the little boy looked to have a high fever because his head and his body were limp in his mother's arms. And it wasn't long before he and his mother were whisked away into a treatment room, leaving the little girl behind with her father in the waiting area. That is, until he suddenly realized that he had left his car parked in the ambulance bay and would have to move it to a parking space. So he told his daughter he would be gone only for a little while, and then placed her in the chair between me and the receptionist. And before leaving, he put his mother's purse on her lap. Now I guessed her age to be about eight or nine years old because her feet couldn't, couldn't quite touch the floor from where she was sitting. And there was a lot going on around us that night, such as a shouting match that broke out between two inebriated patients. I felt responsible to distract this little girl from the chaos, so I tried to keep a conversation going with her. And she would respond to my comments and my questions, but she wouldn't make eye contact with me. And her body language indicated that she was too anxious to connect with me too much. And I figured that she probably was afraid that looking to another adult for comfort might mean giving up hope of seeing her parents again. So there she sat, obediently, patiently, straight-backed, 
chatting away with me, but very tightly holding on to the handles of her mother's purse. Now, I knew full well that this little girl was safe, that her mother was just a few feet away, and that her father would soon join her again in the waiting room once he moved the car. But I also knew that the reality for that little girl, even if for a few moments, her reality was that she was utterly alone and the handles of that purse were her only comfort. That purse must have signaled to her that her mother would not be gone forever and that she would come back. Jesus said to his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you, and a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Like the little girl I sat with that night, the disciples are feeling anxious about Jesus's departure. And this part of John's gospel that Sue read from is often called Jesus's farewell discourse, where on the night before his crucifixion, he prepares his disciples for his return to the Father in heaven through death on a cross. He tells them he will no longer be physically present with them. But that won't mean that they'll be abandoned to figure out all by themselves how to live without him there with them. His spirit, he tells them, will live in them and will guide them in the truth and give them the capacity to love a world that habitually rejects love. I think it'd be interesting exercise to think about what would be at stake? What would have been different had Jesus really left the disciples to figure things out for themselves, sustained entirely by their own wits? I doubt seriously if that were the case that there would even be a church today. And the counterpart to that question is a question that the church should always ask itself. And that is how often do we think and act as though we are in this all by ourselves? During this time of anxiety and disruption in our life together as the church, do we see ourselves as a community that is still being nurtured and sustained by the one in whom we live and move and have our being? Or do we fear that it's been completely left up to us to figure out how we're going to survive this time? Has Jesus left his faithful people orphaned in this time of pandemic? I ask these questions not to lay guilt on any of us who are feeling anxious because I myself feel anxious about this time. But I ask these questions to remind us of the hope that is already within us by virtue of our baptism. As disciples of Jesus, we have been given his spirit to sustain us no matter what. And as disciples, we are not promised an easy life. We are promised eternal life, which doesn't begin when we die, but when we are baptized. We are given Jesus's own life to live all of our days to the glory of God and for the well-being of others. And as unprepared and as abandoned the church may feel in this changing landscape that we're navigating, we have not been left to fend for ourselves as his community. 
because we need only remember his words and then to live them as the truth. That although he is not physically here with us, and although we are not physically with each other, his spirit always has, always is, and always will be at work among us, reconciling all things to God. You and I need only do our part. And Christ has given us one thing to do and one thing only. And that is to love him as he first loved us. And then to aim that love at everyone around us. And whenever love becomes all that we're about, whenever love drives every decision we make as a church and forms every word that flows from our tongues and every deed performed by our hands, whenever love leads the way through the upheavals caused by death, uncertainty, separation, and yes, even pandemic, when we follow the path of love, then Jesus is with us and we truly are alive. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. Let us turn our hearts to the Lord with our prayers. Let us pray. Holy One of Israel, we pray for all who fear you and believe in you, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as Jesus and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord, for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we pray for those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. We pray to you, O Lord, for the peace of the world that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray for those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the health and dignity of every person. We pray for the poor, the persecuted, and all who are suffering all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. And we pray to you, O Lord, for this congregation, that we may be delivered from hard hearts and show forth your glory in all that we do. We thank you for the successful blood drive that was held at the church on Friday, for the generous spirits who walked through the door to give of themselves, to give life to others. We pray for our families and friends and neighbors that being freed from anxiety, we may all live in joy and peace and health. And we pray for all who have died in the communion of your church, that strengthened by their witness, we may be grateful for their example, living in justice and love until we join them in life eternal. Especially today, we give you thanks for the life and witness of Mary Ludic, and that she has entered into her final rest in your loving embrace. Everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Give us purity of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will, no weakness keep us from doing it, that in your light we may see light clearly, and in your service may we find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Thank you.